Eh, soy el Pleasure to introduce Miguel Jicote eh, profesor del Centro de Investigación y Estudios Avanzados de Cimestad, Mexico City. He's one of the leader figures in Mexico in the United Topology, and he'll be speaking on mapping class groups of non-oriental uncertainties. Well, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer for the invitation. So all I'm going to say here uh, is very work with Nestor Colleen. Uh, most of this work is part of his uh, PhD thesis, recently uh, presented. So we just um, go to, yes. <clears throat> To remind you uh, about uh, uh, mapping class groups, so the classical case is the, uh, the case when um, so surfaces are orientable. So you, if you take an orientable surface of G, then the mapping class group of SG is just a uh, group of isotopic classes of orientation different, uh, preserving different morphisms of the surface. This they can be taught as an equation. The orientation preserving the morphisms, but those um, isotopic to the identity. And uh, some, some first examples are presented here. Um, so the mapping class group of the sphere A is trivial because every, every orientation preserving the morphism is, is uh, um, isotopic to the identity. And a much more uh, elaborated uh, example is the one from the Toros. Um, when the uh, mapping class group is the classical modular group, as I do that. So, a, a lot of um, all the others know about mapping class groups. For instance, they, they are generated by uh, dentists about uh, a finite number of curves. Um, and, and there's some variations where you can include mark points in the surface. So you, you start with the different morphisms, um, orientation preserving different morphisms of the surface that leave a set of um, k point invariants, and you look at the uh, set of five components uh, of those. Um, all right. Um, a nice, um, a very interesting problem uh, in relation with the mapping class group. In the so called Nielsen realization problem uh, that asks whether a finite subgroup, whether a finite subgroup of the mapping class group can be lifted isomorphically to the different morphisms. And this um, problem was um, studied since Nielsen over decades until uh, Kirchhoff um, saw it generally uh, in the 80s. So he proved that every Finite subgroup of the mapping class group can be realized as a group of isometries or some hyperbolic structure on um, on the surface. Um, so, so even even more than realizing them by different morphisms. Um, so there's a, another way to um, um, to say this, and uh, one one can observe. For that, one can observe that the mapping class group acts on the technical space of complex structures on the surface, so that um, the quotient is the modular space of Riemann surfaces. And um, so another way to rephrase this uh, result is by saying that every finite subgroup of the mapping class group um, acting on the technical space has a fixed point. Okay. Um, so now, one, one, one can define Ah, excuse me. Yes. Is this corollary? Is, is it corollary? Of this, uh, or it, yes, yes. It's probably another way to say this. Okay, well, well, I, I don't, I don't. There's no mention of hyperbolic structures here, so yes, it's, it's a corollary. But this is. Um, um, I'm sorry. So you mean that these two statements are equivalent, or? Uh, Or one implies the other. At least the, the, the first one implies this. the other. Yeah. Could you, could you please explain why you say 
Sorry if it's stupid question. Well, because this mudra stays is all. All right. Um, we we're thinking of the uh, on the mapping that group acting on on the structures. On the surface. So, um, because you, I think because you can average. So, yeah. once you have on yeah. on the on the on the diagonal space, yeah. one of the points is interpretable as a structure. Every, every point in the diagonal space can you can interpret as a structure. Yeah. Maybe you are you can average, and one of the structures would be. Just because it is a fine and separate, then you can average. So the first implies the second rapid. Right, if, if this um, can be realized as a group of isometries, it doesn't change the structure. Yeah, so it's fixed. Uh, so you pull back and you average. Ah, uh, I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Right. I'm just kidding. I'm say that. So now, uh, um, you can you can pass you can pass to the case with mark points by defining the regular uh, space of the surface with k mark points in a similar fashion, and it was a uh, uh, more proven by uh, work of Volker, Meiser, and Wolf that um, um, a, a similar result holds for the extended so called extended mapping chart group uh, on the surface with uh, k mark points. So this is the, the, the mapping chart group, which is defined using um, orientation preserving and, and reversing isomorphisms. So, so the result of, of Volker and Master and Wolf says that every finite subgroup of the extended mapping chart group acting on, on this peculiar space um, with mark points has a fixed. So whenever we solve um, a problem in um, orientable surfaces, one uh, wonders where it can be um, addressed for the non orientable case. Right? So, um, this is the way when one defines the um, uh, mapping class group for uh, non orientable surfaces. So, we, one takes um, all the different morphisms of, of NG that fix uh, K points and mod out by the by all different morphisms isotopic to the identity. Right? So, uh, uh, excuse me, but yes. may I ask you a, that's a related question? So, I mean, so can I also say something like this for other type of subgroup or monarchy cross group? So, I mean, not only finite group, but maybe finite index subgroup or something like that. Right, but it, I mean, the, this problem. You mean the, the listing problem? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it won't hold um, for the, all the subgroups. Oh, yeah, yeah. So in particular. Uh, so, which type of group? I mean, finite group, there's always lift. Right, there right. Any well, other? Um, it, it's known to fail for infinite subgroups, say. I always fail for infinite not, subgroups. Well, not in general. Right. Uh, so, for instance, what I want to say here is that uh, there's no section. So this group, the, 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 the mapping class group is, is um, uh, starting from minus three is infinite, and uh, for instance, you cannot find a section here. So, so this, 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 the whole group won't lift to the, back to the different modules. So yeah, um, I mean, the special cases of this, uh, this um, mapping class group for non orientable surfaces are known. So, for instance, for the Klein bottle, uh, the mapping class group is, is the uh, Klein group, C2 cross C2, for um, a connected sum of three projected planes, um, is the group G L2Z. And uh, so, what we are able to prove 
the problem is that the, the, any any finite subgroup of the mapping class group, of the non orientable mapping class group, lifts back to the digital morphisms, right? But um, we, we, we can also show in contrast that for um, large G, this projection doesn't have a section. And we're going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, so in, in, in order to work with the inner spaces, we um, endow, uh, we see non orientable surfaces as client surfaces. Right? So we know what the, we know that a, at an app and the function that a function is analytic, it, it satisfies the uh, Cauchy equations. So we can um, say that if it's anti analytic, if it satisfies um, corresponding system of equations um, with respect to the conjugate uh, variable. And we say that the map is the analytic if the restriction to uh, connected components is one for the other, right? So um, a client surface is just analog of a Riemann surface um, asking that the change of uh, um, charts is the analytic in general. And we will be uh, denote the set of the analytic structures by M of sigma. All right. So now we can we can talk about uh, morphisms between uh, Riemann surfaces, between giant surfaces, and, and those are maps, continuous maps, so that um, um, they are they are analytic uh, locally, and also the even a, a client surface and a different morphism, say from sigma to sigma, we can uh, uh, define the pullback of the given the analytic structure as the only structure so that this map is the analytic for a All right, so now um, um, if you've given um, an unorientable client surface. Um, an orientable double cover for that is going to be a Riemann surface um, together with a the analytic projection, right? And also um, with, equipped with an analytic involution in this way, so that uh, the projection um, is compatible with the, with the involution. So in the compact case, uh, we're just looking at, at the double cover of an unorientable surface in this way, so that this uh, um, diagram for me. Right. So, so we are. Um, so in this case, we have a, a Riemann surface equipped with a, with a, an involution, so that ng is gotten by quotienting out um, the Riemann surface by the involution. So now, uh, every uh, diffeomorphism of an unorientable surface, that is k-point invariant, uh, admits two lifting to the uh, orientable double core. And one of those, uh, exactly one of those, preserves orientation. Right? So this induces a map, actually a homomorphism, from this group of diffeomorphisms of the unorientable surface, to the group of uh, orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of the double cover, right? Um, leaving a um, 2 k point invariant. And this, homo this homomorphism passes uh, to the level of mapping class groups in this way. And it's um, known that, um, well, if you don't have mark points, then these. Uh, homomorphism is injected in the genesis of this three and um, if you have at least one mark point then this map is this, this homomorphism is always injected for every gene right? so so we can inject the mapping class group the non orientable mapping class group into the orientable one right and also um, we have a similar situation 
at the level of time zero spaces. So in general, if um, you have 2D analytic structures in your surface, we want to say that they are time zero equivalent if they differ by um, a different morphism which is isotopic to the identity. Uh, another way of saying this is that uh, um, X and Y two dynamic structures on a client surface are, are equivalent if there is a, um, a different morphism isotopic to the identity, so then uh, one is the pullback of the other on your path. Right? And now it's, 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 we know that uh, if you work with Riemann surfaces, if you work in the readable case, these are uh, um, the linear space. Um, um, which is a quotient uh, of the um, space of all structures under this action um, is a nuclear space of dimension CG minus 6 plus 2K. And in the non orientable case, um, is a nuclear space of dimension 3G minus 3 plus 2K. Right? Um, so now, there's a way we can go from the non orientable technical space to the orientable one, uh, or having my k mark point in a g to a 2k mark point in s g minus 1 by sending um, um, an structure, the analytic structure, to the pullback under the prediction pi, uh, getting a structure of a ring and surface here. And it's uh, not difficult to prove that the image of this uh, map is given by the uh, um, set of uh, all the structures that are invariant under the evolution sigma. So now, Excuse uh, me, what is yes, sigma? sigma is just the evolution. Yes, yes. So, so, so uh, whenever you have client surface, say, we're in the compact case, so we have a, a client surface of uh, genus G, when you look at the double cover, and there's always this evolution um, that commutes with, uh, that is uh, compatible with the projection in such a way that uh, NG is the portion. But, I mean, how can I say? So, but you, when I when I start from this S G minus one, this Riemann surface compact to oriented Riemann surface with genus G minus one, you yeah. fix you fix sigma and then I mean so there can be many sigma, right? So whenever I have a Riemann surface with genus G minus one, then there can be many fixed point free involution. Uh, so there can be any many Evolution, is it? Or, uh, I mean, what I want to ask you is, is this sigma unique here? Or? It doesn't have to be unique, but it has to be compatible with uh, the party in this way. To make it just a, um, a big transformation for this projection. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, so what, I mean, so if you, I see, I see. Ah, thank you. Yeah, I see. Right. Um, right. So, um, so we now um, go to the proof of the mean centralization theorem. So we have already have injections from the normally called mapping class group. K mark points into orientable mapping group with two K mark points, and uh, by pullbacks we have an inclusion um, of the tacular space of N G with K mark points into the tacular space of N G minus one with two K mark points. So now um, the mapping class group acts on, on the tacular space by pullbacks. Uh, this is in the orientable case, so this group acts on this space. And also this group at in this space. And um, what the natural uh, thing to expect is that uh, 
these inclusions are equivalent with respect to his actions, just as Andres was telling us in the previous talk. So um, all the functions are, are compatible in this way. And uh, what we are able to prove is now is that uh, every finite subgroup G of the non reusable mapping class group acting on the Hessinger uh, space has a fixed. So, so, so now it's, the proof is very formal. So you you um, you have such a subgroup right? here. You can look at its image on the inclusion file, right? And then think of the the group generated by the image of G and the class of the involution. Right? Remember, this is an orientation reversing um, uh, uh, map here. So, so you land in the extended mapping class group. Right? Well, you already know that um, that finite subgroups of, well, actually, when one can prove that um, that uh, um, that this image commutes with a class of, of sigma, and then the subgroup generated by those is just the product of G cross sigma 2. Right? We already know by the results of Popper and others that uh, um, this final subgroup of the extended mapping class group has a, has a fixed point. Right? So there is a structure, there is a point of this terminal space which is by, fixed by uh, this product, and in particular is fixed on the, the evolution. But we knew that um, all those uh, structures fixed on the, the evolution uh, correspond to the image of the Tagliere space, the non orientable Tagliere space under pi star. So now, um, so we know this is in the image. Um, so that of y must be a uh, pi star of, of x for some structure uh, on, on ng. Right? And then uh, it is to see that this is the uh, fixed point we were looking So we have this, this um, equality, and since uh, pi star is a monomorphism, since pi star was uh, an inclusion, then you get that alpha um, applied to x is plus at the x. So this is the uh, fixed point. All right. So back to your question. So what about other groups? So um, what about infinite groups? Right? Can, be, can, can they be lifted? Well, ask you something, sorry, about yes. the previous. So, so, can you say, I mean, is this uh, fixed point in any way uh, constructible? Or, I mean, do you know, any, can you say anything about it? Because, uh, you know, you, you have a finite proof. Are you able to kind of identify the fixed point in any way? Or, or is it this? I guess it's this result of Walford, right? That, yeah. Uh, so I don't know how constructible that is. So, uh, uh, but yeah, it probably depends mostly on the uh, description of the image of the non-orientable linear space inside the uh, orientable one. The fact that you can find a, a fixed point with respect to the extended mapping that we like Walter and others. Anyway, uh, just curious. Yeah, it's more like a system kind of thing. And um, so, what are all these subgroups? Uh, well, what what I want to show is that uh, if um, the genus of the surface is large, then 
And this projection does not admit a section. And, and to do this, we use characteristic classes. So let me remind you a bit about this. Um, so if you have a you have a smooth orientable surface bundle, right? so this is your interval case. So if you have a smooth bundle with um, fiber SG, then you can always look at the so-called vertical bundle, which is the kernel of the differential. It was a, a map of uh, two, between the two tangent bundles. And um, well, this 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 is a two-dimensional oriented oriented vector vector bundle over E. So it um, it has another class, right? And um, out of this um, other class, you can define the so-called uh, minimum oriented mover classes for the original bundle by uh, looking at the powers. The angles one powers of the other class and uh, taking the image of the Bekisi um, homomorphism. I just uh, go from the cohomology of V to the cohomology of the, the base and always the degree by two. Um, the, well, um, one application of those classes. Um, um, is a description of the uh, cohomology of the uh, stable mapping class group. Uh, um, and the thing is that, um, well, we have a universal bundle for the surface bundles, um, with whose base is a classifying space of all the different morphisms. These are, these are supposed to be orientation precise morphisms, sorry about that. And, um, so that any other bundle, any other SG bundle, is a pullback of the universal bundle, right? So, um, so we have classes defined for uh, the universal bundle and the classes for any other um, bundle that got in as pullbacks. Right? Um, so in in the case the genus is further equal to two, we know the cohomology of the classifying space is just the cohomology of the master class group of the G, and it's a theorem of our Miller Morita and Harder that the natural map from this polynomial algebra on the, the kappa i's um, is an isomorphism in this stable range. So that takes care of the, uh, that describes the irrational cohomology of the stable mapping curve. So now, what, what about the, the non orientable case? Well, we don't have, in the non orientable case, we don't have uh, Euler classes in general, right? So we uh, have to look for an alternative description for that. And, well, given a, recall that um, given this, um, bundle the map from E to B, we can define the so-called vector equality transfer from the suspension spectra of the base back to the suspension spectra of the total space, right? And um, this, this, this transfer has many nice features. Um, well, okay. we, can, we can think of the cohomologies of the suspension spectra as being the cohomology of the original spaces. And the thing we're getting is just a, a map um, in the wrong direction in cohomology. Right? Um, so it's known that uh, if we compose this mapping cohomology with the mapping used by the bundle itself, to the multiplication by the uh, order characteristic of the fiber. So, um, in the oriented case, um, one property of this transfer is that uh, when we apply to x is equal to the easy map applied to x times the other class of the vertical bundle. Right? So in that case, the mobile um, monitor classes could be defined as the transfer applied to the uh, other class of the vertical bundle right to the f. And in particular, if um, 
you look at um, again when n is even, then the kappa two n can be gotten as the transfer of the um, first control transfer class of the uh, vertical bundle right to the end. So that that's the case where I mean, this is not n but two n. So this will be a description for the uh, even even kappas. So we we can we can use these formulas motivation to define um, the corresponding classes uh, for normal interval bundles, surface bundles, right? So start with an eta normal interval surface bundle, so the fiber in NG, and you can look at the uh, look at the vertical bundle um, because of the first contracting class, and then define the class say that i to be the transfer of the i power of this projecting class. So naturally, um, this leads in h4i of the base. And, uh, well, one place to, to search for them is this uh, universal bundle for um, non-relatable surface bundles. So you get you get classes in the cohomology of the classifying space of diffeomorphisms of NG. Uh, that turns out to be the cohomology of the mapping class group um, for G at least three. And uh, a result of Natalie Wall, um, sorry, the large of it, Max and Ulrich Tillman and Michael Bice, is that um, these classes describe the uh, cohomology of the uh, stable mapping class group in the non-orientable case. So, um, so this is an isomorphism. So the natural map uh, that, that sends uh, each of these variables to the corresponding class here um, is an isomorphism in this range. So in particular, um, these classes, these set i classes, are not here or here. Um, so remember, this they live in, in, in dimension four i, right? So if this star is four i, then that means that um, t minus three is greater or equal than sixteen times i. And well, this says this implies that uh, the set i is a non-zero in the cohomology of the mapping class group. If G is greater or equal than 69, is true. All right. Excuse me. Yes. So, uh, if you go to the previous one. Something happened. Okay. So, this chi i is not. So since uh, uh, the images, yeah. So this is a slight yeah. addition of, of notation. Yeah. So of course, uh, you have an right object here, but you're looking at the image there. So so any every zeta i here goes to the class that we define. Yeah. Over here, so in principle, you don't know whether that's zero or not. Oh, yeah. right. But the theorem of these uh, fellows tells you that um, that these these two graded rings are isomorphic in that oh, I see, I see. in those dimensions. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So provided that the dimension you're looking at is less than or equal to g minus three. Oh. For which is the genus of the surface. Yeah, I see. Thank you. And then, since this say that i lives in dimension 4i, then uh, that's where you get the feeling from. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So this is, uh, so, so, so now the, the, the proof that the, the non existence of a section is, is pretty formal. Um, so uh, for that, what we do is, is we, we show this, this little lemma 
that says that uh, if you go from the diffeomorphisms uh, of the non-orientable surface to the mapping class group and um, look at this group as a, as a discrete group, then uh, the image in cohomology of the zeta i's here is zero for i greater or equal to two. So we need to prove this. I'm thinking of, of this as a discrete group. So now, what about the, the non-existence of the section? Well, if, if there was a section, if there was a section you can pass to cohomology, right? And so the composition of these two homomorphisms would be the identity. So you have something on zero there. But um, um, so for i equal to, um, we already know this class is non zero if g is greater or equal to 16 times 2 plus 3, which is 35. Right? But this lemma tells us that the, uh, the image of zeta i is zero. So that's a contradiction. And um, so, yeah, uh, you cannot lift um, infinite subgroups in general. What is this lemma? What, I mean, what is the point of this? Uh, I mean, is the, you mean, is it important to think that I can see this diffeomorphism group, group as this Greek group? Or? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, for whenever I have this Greek group, this, this kind of, I think, very simple, so, uh, I mean, so, I mean, could you briefly explain what is the idea of this lemma? I mean, proof of this lemma. Well, you're just comparing this, the, cohomology, the cohomology of these two groups as, 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 ah. as um, discrete groups. So this, this, this is a discrete group. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. This is a topological group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so um, it's either you pass first to classifying spaces, and then um, think of the induced mapping cohomology or compare them as a, a discrete groups. We don't need the topology. That's the, that the point. That we don't need the topology. If you ignore the topology on this group, then um, the induced mapping cohomology, the cohomology of groups, uh, satisfies this. And this uh, uh, gives you the contradiction. As long as you Take the genus high enough. All right. All right. So, um, so let me. So, so I, I said something about the rational cohomology. Let me talk about um, uh, uh, torsion. Right. So, what I wanted to say in the second part of the talk was to. Uh, um, um, Give a few remarks about the Pareto homology of, of these mapping class groups. So, um, Pareto homology is a cohomology theory that is uh, um, defined for groups that are virtually um, torsion free. So, they, they, they contain um, um, torsion free subgroups of finite index, right? And that uh, index. You know, to, uh, it's, it's called the virtual cohomological dimension of. of ooh, no. let, let me say that again. The, 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 the cohomological dimension of these uh, virtually torsion free uh, subgroups um, is called the virtual cohomological dimension of the group gamma. So, for these kind of groups, um, Farrell introduced the. Uh, um, what we call now the Farrell homology, and this is defined in terms of a, of a complete resolution for the group. And well, this is a, a generalization of the uh, Tate cohomology for finite groups in some sense. So um, the thing we know that is that um, that. The Farrell cohomology coincides with the usual cohomology above the uh, um, virtual cohomological dimension, 
we know um, that uh, the groups are zero if the group is torsion free, and all of these are, are torsion groups. So in particular, when m is the integers, when we look at the homology with integer coefficients, you can decompose this as the product of the three primary components. So um, with integer coefficients, we can talk about periodic cohomology. So we say the Fourier cohomology is periodic, or p periodic, if it satisfies this equation for a fixed d, right? And whenever you have a group with p periodic cohomology, then the, the famous uh, Brown formula holds. Namely, you can you can recover the p primary component of the cohomology as the product of the cohomologies of the normalizers of uh, um, cyclic subgroups of order uh, of order p, where this product is taken of, of uh, over conjugacy classes of, of simon pits inside the group. All right. So now um, uh, there is a way to um, to find a p period, and it's um, uh, gotten as, as follows. So say that you have a, one of these groups of virtual of finite virtual cohomological dimension, right? So you can find a torsion free subgroup there, right? And say that you have a um, subgroup of all prime order p inside of gamma, right? Since this is torsion free, then this group passes to the quotient isomorphically, right? And um, one should remember that the multi cohomology of the C mod P is um, exterior on a class of dimension one, tensor polynomial on a class of dimension two. So uh, when you go from the cohomology of gamma to the cohomology of pi uh, and reduce coefficient mod P, then this image lands only in the polynomial part of the cohomology. Moreover, um, it should land on a polynomial algebra, this form, um, on, 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 a, on a power of this polynomial variable. Um, and uh, you, can, you can look for the uh, maximum m so that this image lands in this polynomial algebra. Right. So it, uh, no, a well-known result that if, if gamma has periodic cohomology, then the p period the, uh, is given as the uh, LTM of two times um, m of pi and gamma, where pi runs over our subgroups of order p. And what we are able to prove is that the, the genus of the orientable surface is, is is two, then um, uh, if the mapping class group contains p torsion, then the p period is exactly four. So you don't have many cohomology groups to worry about. And this is the idea of the proof. Um, so say that um, you have your, your uh, single p included in the mapping class group, and say it will work in the case k equal to one. One more point. Um, so, so, so by the Nielsen realization theorem, you can leave this group to the diffeomorphisms of the surface. So you have a group uh, of all p acting on, on the surface, and um, well, uh, you can you can get a faithful representation by uh, passing to the um, a differential uh, of every diffeomorphism, right? Um, provided that this group uh, fixes a point, x not say. So we get that um, we get a a Gorilla's diagram this way, and you can pass to cohomology. Um, so it's well known that the uh, uh, contracting class here 
goes to the square of the uh, uh, third class, first third class up here, right? And thus we can find um, a non zero element in the cohomology of pi uh, that lives in dimension four, right? So dimension four corresponds to, since this was two dimensional already, corresponds to m equal to two, right? And two times two is four. That's where you um, get by the PPR in this board. All right. Um, so what about um, the computation of the uh, Farrell cohomology? So I, I told you that uh, Farrell's cohomology for um, these kinds of groups, whenever the group has PPR cohomology, can be gotten as the product of the cohomologies of the normalizers, right, of um, simul beads inside uh, gamma. So we need to classify those, and um, well, this is was classically done uh, by Nielsen and all people uh, by means of the fixed point data of the morphisms. So um, say that you have a, a orientation preserving diffeomorphism on a surface of order p. So this phi uh, uh, generates uh, a group of order p acting on the surface. So for this um, uh, morphism, for this uh, diffeomorphism, uh, you have a finite uh, set of fixed points. And that we know is that uh, this, this, this phi acts by rotation on these groups uh, with respect to us some fixed Riemann structure. Um, moreover, you can correct this rotation by writing phi to some um, appropriate exponents so that these, these rotations, this phi acts by multiplication by a, by a primitive root of unity, right? And the collection of these corrections is what we call the fixed point data for these different models. So now, um, what Nielsen proved is that uh, two different morphisms of all the P are conjugated if and only if they have the same fixed point data. Right? And moreover, one knows that uh, the fixed point data depend only on the isotopic class of phi. So what you can do, what you can conclude out of this is that if you uh, define um, a fixed point data for uh, an element in the mapping class group uh, as the fixed point data of a representative, then two elements in the mapping class group are conjugated if and only if they have the same fixed point data. Right. So now um, you can do the same in the non-readable case, um, given a, a Diffeomorphism of order p um, in a non orientable surface, you can you can uh, define similarly the fixed point data. Uh, this time, these are defined are well defined up to a sign, right? And we introduce this this equivalent relation, this congruence. We say that uh, uh, um, delta phi is congruent to delta phi prime if and only if the, uh, the corresponding fixed point data uh, differ by uh, plus or minus one, right? And we can include the case of uh, mark points by, um, by defining the fixed point data uh, of phi to be um, a t-tuple of this sort, where the first k betas give you an ordered tuple, and um, they are a fixed point data of the of the mark points, and the rest are um, an ordered t minus k tuple, and um, we can we can introduce here a similar um, uh, congruence relation, and this is what defined. Uh, on, at the level of mapping class groups and mapping class groups with uh, mark points. So what one can show is that uh, two elements of the mapping of the mapping class group are conjugate 
if and only if they uh, have the same uh, fixed point data uh, with respect to this notion. And the, the reason why one has to introduce these um, uh, other betas is because, uh, well, you're looking at the KMR points, but you may have more fixed points, like right, even uh, uh, different morphism. So um, what we're able to show is that, uh, well, we, we needed that these groups have a uh, torsion and uh, we can show that um, the mapping class group contains a subgroup of order P if and only if um, the Riemann Horowitz equation holds, right? For some T and H satisfying these conditions. And um, also, if uh, the genus is bigger than two and, and you pick it on prime, then uh, if this group has P torsion, then it has periodic cohomology. And um, if you have um, g greater than 2, k greater or equal to 1, and t bigger than 1, um, are integers satisfying this, this, this equation, then when you can uh, see that um, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between congress, congress classes of decoupons of this sort, of fixed point data of this sort, satisfying this condition, and conjugacy classes of order P subgroups of all, the mapping class group um, acting on the surface with T fixed points. So um, out of the result, one can classify uh, the uh, normalizers, well, the conjugacy classes of uh, of uh, similar piece inside the, the mapping class group, and um, and when when this example is the case of genus uh, P, uh, so in this case the only solution uh, for the um, Riemann Hurwitz equation is h and t equal to 1 and 2. Um, and in, in this example, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to, to see what the normalizers of the CP are. So they turn out to be dihedral groups. So you know their cohomology, uh, which is given in this way. And also, you can see you can count now the number of, uh, of uh, conjugacy classes then you, you're able to say what the uh, uh component of the homology of the mapping class group is. And it's given in this way. And this is probably a good place to stop. Any questions? So the theorem from the previous you should think about a kind of a version of the this Nelson. Theorem for the unoriented case, uh, the characterization of the. Um, you mean the fixed point? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Right. The thing is, you you have to adapt the uh, the notion of fixed point data here. So that's why you have to do this kind of partition of the this beta. Betas yes. was made of. Uh, well, <coughs> I like to thank you all for your participation at the conference. Thank you. <coughs> thank you for making it a great conference. We'll see you at the next event. <laughs>